Do you regret this comparison? Um, yes. I, I talked to the head of the uh, uh, Anti-Defamation League, uh, Abe uh, Foxman, this morning, following up on a letter I had sent over the weekend apologizing for the use of the word crystal knock. Uh, it was a, a terrible word to have chosen. Um, I, like many, have tried to understand the 20th century and uh, the incomprehensible evil of the Holocaust. It, it can't be explained. Even to try to explain it is questionable. It's wrong. It's evil. Now, I use the word because during the Occupy of San Francisco by the Occupy Wall Street crowd, uh, they broke the windows in the Wells Fargo Bank. They marched up to our automobile strip on Van Ness Avenue and broke all the windows in all the luxury car dealerships. And I saw that. I remember that the police just stood by frozen. And I thought, well, this is how Kristallnacht began. So that word was in my mind. But um, I did, uh, I don't necessarily need to read from this letter, but if you're interested, I, I can. Sure, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I deeply apologize. This is a letter I wrote to the uh, Anti-Defamation League. I deeply apologize to you and any who have mistaken my reference to Kristallnacht as a sign of overt or latent anti-Semitism. This is not the case. My late partner, Eugene Kleiner, fled Hitler from Austria and fought in the U.S. Army. We became the deepest of friends during, during our long association, and he taught me, quote, never imagine that the unimaginable cannot become real. He was never comfortable with the extreme political currents in America and never took our freedom from demonization for granted. I believe that he would have understood my Wall Street Journal letter and would have agreed with the warning. Uh, and then I apologized for using Crystal Knock, as I just said before. And I had a pleasant discussion uh, with Abe Foxman just before I came here, and I, I hope that at least that part is put to rest. So, more than 90 Jews were killed in Kristallnacht, 30,000 people put in concentration camps. Right. What were you going for? I, analogy. I, the, the Jews were only 1% of the German population. Most Germans had never met a Jew, and yet Hitler was able to demonize the Jews, and Kristallnacht was one of the earlier manifestations, but there had been others before it. And then, of course, we know about the evil of the Holocaust. I, I guess my point was that when you start to use hatred against a minority, it can get out of control. I think that was my thought. And now that, as a messenger, I've been thoroughly killed by everybody, at least read the message. You, know? you mentioned the word hatred. Yes. Do you feel threatened? I don't feel personally threatened, uh, but I think that a very important part of America, namely the creative 1%, are threatened. I, I've, I'm friends with uh, Al Gore, uh, who tells me that uh, inequality is the number one problem in America. I'm friends with Jerry Brown. I voted for him. I will vote for him, even though he raised my taxes 30 percent. Uh, he tells me the number one problem in America is inequality. And that's probably and possibly true. And I think President Obama is going to make that point tomorrow night. But the one percent are not causing the inequality. They are the job creators. I mean, Silicon Valley is, I think Kleiner Perkins itself over the years has created pretty close to a million jobs, and we're still doing it. Uh, it it's absurd to <laughs> demonize the rich for being rich and for doing what the rich do 
which is get richer by creating opportunity for others. How do you feel threatened? Oh, well, I said I didn't feel personally threatened. I feel, however, that as a class, I think we are beginning to engage in class warfare. I think the rich as a class are threatened through higher taxes, higher regulation, uh, and so forth. And so that is my message. If this is the kind of persecution that is happening to the 1%, yes. what's happening to the 99%? I think the 99%, I mean, I, I did not come originally from the 1%. I grew up as one of the 99 percenters. And so I'm your classical self-made man, if you will. Uh, I think the 99% is struggling and really struggling to get along in America. I mean, we have ever-increasing regulation, higher costs, I think, caused by more government than we need. Uh, small business, it's difficult to form and prosper in a small business these days. It's difficult to hire. Uh, and that, that, in my view, is what is hurting and causing, hurting the 99% and causing the inequality. Uh, so I think that the solution is less interference, lower taxes, let the rich do what the rich do, which is get richer, but along the way, they bring everybody else with them when the system is working. Now, you are a multimillionaire. No, I'm not a billionaire. I'm You're a multimillionaire. Multi I said multimillionaire. I've, I've created some billionaires, but I unfortunately am not one. You have owned fancy yachts, yes. fancy cars, yes. an underwater submersible airplane. Underwater you, airplane. I, I, I saw it. It's basically an airplane that flies underwater. Right. Do you worry at all that you are divorced from reality? Are you divorced from reality? I, I don't know if anybody can answer that uh, <laughs> truthfully. I don't think so. I give and have given and will give millions and millions of dollars to a long list of charities. I have in mind some more uh, chairs at universities uh, to give. Uh, I still want to leave my children something that they can have, uh, even though upon my death the government will take about 45 percent. Um, so yeah, I think I'm connected to reality. I, I've got lots and lots of friends uh, that are younger and uh, in this whole uh, uh, web-based, uh, uh, Twitter-based world. Uh, and I think I know what they're thinking and talking about, yes. What about Silicon Valley? Is Silicon Valley, to a certain extent, divorced from reality? You have kids. You mentioned you created billionaires. You have kids making six-figure salaries, getting free perks at technology companies, taking shuttles uh, with Wi-Fi access down to the peninsula, which regular residents don't have access to. Is there something to be said for this idea that Silicon Valley really is living in its own little bubble? Uh, yeah, I think there's something in that. Uh, on the other hand, it's a bubble that has created, that has changed the world, has created incredible wealth, you know, around America and around the world. And maybe you have to put up with a little techno geek arrogance in order to um, get the results of those sort of folks thinking. Um, so, uh, <laughs> how do you see this divide playing out? Um, well, now that as the messenger I've been shot, I think at least read the message. <laughs> and, but you just said at the beginning of this that you, regr you regret the, the way this the, message the, was I conveyed. regret the use of that word. It was a terrible misjudgment. I don't regret the message at all. In fact, I... What is the message? The message is any time the majority starts to demonize a minority, no matter what it is, it's wrong and dangerous, and no good ever comes from it.
What's the solution? First, to understand the problem, uh, be aware of it. That's why I wrote the letter. Uh, and I, I don't apologize for writing the letter. I should not have used that awful word. But the letter said what I believed. And I believe we have to be careful that we don't demonize uh, anybody and that we certainly don't demonize the most creative part of our society.